thank you for joining us tonight for the Jake McCandless uh, 51 PVC Speaker Series. I'm Molly Marcusman, the Ford Family Director of Athletics. Uh, the Jake McCandless 51 uh, PVC Speaker Series was endowed in the name of JL Jake McCandless, class of 51, one of our esteemed uh, football coaches who coached the Princeton, coached Princeton to the 1969 Ivy League Football Championship during the Tigers' centennial year of football. This year marks the 15th anniversary of this speaker series, which has featured over, over those 15 years, many dynamic speakers across so many impactful areas in sport and society. We're so grateful to the speaker series lead donor, Bert Kerstetter, uh, class of 66, and all others who supported uh, the speaker series and have made this event tonight possible. Um, this event tonight is also part of our year-long celebration of 50 years of women's athletics at Princeton. Um, we have spent this year highlighting just some of the many incredible stories of alumni who have competed for the Tigers and gone on to do incredible things after graduation. Um, we hope you've been able to log on, visit our website, uh, listen to our podcasts, uh, view all of the content on social media. We have podcasts, videos, book excerpts, and much more celebrating this fantastic um, celebration. So every, everyone knows that I never miss a chance to uh, brag about the Tigers. So let me just throw a few fun stats at you tonight um, about our collective success of our women's teams. So among many, many individual honors, um, we have won a remarkable 243 league championships and 56 national championships. As you can imagine, this is by far the most in the Ivy League. And very notably, something we're really proud of, we have, we've had 52 uh, female head coaches over our history. And right now we have 11 uh, current women's head coaches, which is leading the way in the NCAA. So th those are some of our achievements, which we're extremely proud of. But Princeton Athletics is about more than winning. I think you all know that. We talk all the time about providing our student athletes with the opportunity to achieve, serve, and lead. We are so excited about tonight's program, as it's my great honor to speak with two tremendous alumni who have done all three. Both have been remarkably successful in their careers. Both have a strong commitment to giving back to Princeton and other causes that need them. And both are now leading, leading in the world of women's athletics and are on the cutting edge of what it means to invest in women's athletics at the highest level. So their bios are gonna pop up throughout this, but I'm just gonna give you a few highlights of our esteemed guests. First, we're joined by Angie Knight and Long, class of 97 and S97. Angie was a two-time national champion and rugby All-American at Princeton. Her husband, Chris, is also a Princetonian class of 97 who played basketball for the Tigers and is one of our most committed uh, alumni leaders. Uh, Angie is currently the chief investment officer and co-owner of Palmer Square Capital Management. The, the firm manages more than 15 billion in assets. Um, Angie is a pioneer in the credit derivatives industry and is credited with creating the high yield debt index, uh, which is the first liquid credit trading index. Previously, Angie spent a number of years in senior management roles with JP Morgan Chase um, and company. So Angie is a co-founder and lead owner of Kansas City NWSL, which you're gonna hear much more about tonight. So I'm not gonna steal, steal her thunder. Um, so Chris and Angie have two girls and two boys, and we're really excited to have Angie join us tonight. And, and joining Angie is Kara Nortman, who is also happens to be a member of the great class of 97. Uh, Kara was a women's open rowing letter winner where she rowed under head coach Lori Daphne. She's currently a partner at Upfront Ventures, the largest venture capital firm in Los Angeles. Some, some of her notable investments include Parachute Home, Territory, Fleet, Fleet Smith, STEM, and Open Raven. But really interestingly, over 50% of her portfolio is led by women CEOs. Earlier in her career, Kara spent time at Morgan Stanley, Microsoft, and Battery Ventures. Kara also is one of the co-founders and owners of Angel, Angel City Football Club, also a member team in the NWSL. The team was founded in 2020 and will begin competing in 2022. Kara is also an advisor to the Women's National Soccer Team Players Association. Uh, and finally, Kara and her husband, Jake Blumenthal, have three girls whose passion for soccer, as you'll learn, helped inspire Kara to lead in this way. So let's welcome Angie and Kara. Hi. Hey, guys. Hi. Thrilled to be here. How's Thank you for having us. We've yeah. all been remarking on your unbelievable jacket tonight, Kara. So thanks <laughs> for giving us that thrill. 
Well, one of the benefits of living in LA is people give you very strange fashion items over the years. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. This just happened to be one that you can show at, at Princeton all the time, right? Exactly. Princeton or Vegas. It's the only place I wear it. There you go. All right. Well, let's just, just jump right into this. So you've both been, you know, again, I could have done your bios the whole night, but um, you've both been highly successful in your respective fast paced, challenging careers. So, so why have you both decided to invest in women's athletics and why is this moment in time different, I think, for women's athletics in, in your minds? And maybe I'll go to Angie first. Sure. Um, you know, Kara was a bit of an inspiration for me in, in making this investment. I, you know, it's something that I don't even think I knew was possible. Uh, she and I had, had both been, um, at the women's world cup in 2019 and both incredibly inspired by it. Um, but, you know, I remember talking to Kara shortly after the world cup and, and her saying, you know, it's crazy that LA doesn't have a women's team. And I'm putting a group together to, to bring a, a women's professional soccer team to LA. And I went, whoa, wait, wait, tell, tell me everything, you know, how do you do that? How does it work? And, um, really, you know, let that sort of deeply sink in and then had an opportunity and it came together really fast um, for us in Kansas City, but had an opportunity uh, to pair with a coach that we've known for a long, long time um, who'd been involved. Kansas City had had a professional women's team before and had lost their team. And he had been um, involved with that group and, you know, said to me and to Chris, hey, would you have any interest bringing professional women's soccer back to Kansas city. And, you know, I absolutely, I mean, I almost fell out of my chair because I still hadn't exactly figured out how we were going to make that happen um, in Kansas city. But, you know, as far as how it relates to what I do on the investing side, um, I think it's, it, it's in a lot of ways, this is not something that I went into thinking about it from the investment perspective, but the more that I spent looking at it from the investment perspective, the the easier decision that that it became. I mean, I think it's I think it's it's a layup from um, you know from an investing perspective because of the amount you know uh, on a relative basis to what it takes to get into men's sport and the trajectory and really I think the parabolic growth and potential um, and the cost of entry point is still sadly for you know, just that it's sad that it's a fact, but I guess good for us that it, um, that it is really a, a, a pretty attractive entry point and with just huge upside. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm not surprised that you guys did it quickly, knowing you and Chris, that you guys just jumped in and made it happen. So not a surprise. Uh, Kara, tell us, tell us your story, because it's really interesting also. And I know, as, as Angie said, you guys have talked a lot about this and have been you know, partnering with each other on, on idea generation and ways to make this happen. But love to hear your story. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll back you up because mine goes back to 2015. But one of the things that's interesting as I think about Angie's background versus mine is that it may seem similar to people watching. We're both investors, but we actually both invest in probably very different risk profile parts of the market. So Angie's looking at credit and I invest in very early stage venture capital. So I'm, I'm essentially, essentially when maybe 80% of the companies I invest in may not work. And so the reason I bring that up is in a lot of ways, it, it, my journey took me to sort of looking at the opportunity in women's soccer as more of a venture capital market opportunity, where I joke around that um, kind of my goal is to for people to think I'm crazy when I make the investment, and then six to 12 months later to think, oh my gosh, I need to do this. Um, and you kind of want to see it before other people do. But my, my story backs up to 2015. I um, went to the 2015 Vancouver finals for the Women's World Cup with my parents who are probably watching, uh, Don and Doreen Nortman, and my husband and my three daughters. And coming out of that game was just such an amazing experience. I tried to buy jerseys and find content, like find games to watch when I came back, NWSL games, which and I now are owners of Teams In. And I couldn't, I literally couldn't get anyone to take my money. I went to nine stores in Vancouver to buy a jersey found one for, for three of my daughters, couldn't find a player's name on the back. So I was looking for Alex Morgan, Megan Rapino, Megan Klingenberg, could not find 
jerseys. And then I got back and I wanted to watch um, the NWSL games and they just weren't carried anywhere. So all I could do was get to know players through Instagram. And honestly, in a way, I don't think any of this would have happened if Instagram and social media didn't exist because there was at least one channel to go follow players and, and keep one's enthusiasm alive. And it's a bit of a long story there, so I'm not going to tell all of it, um, but feel free to ask more questions if you truly want to know. But it ultimately, um, it ultimately came out of a bunch of friendships, the most significant of which was with a woman named Natalie Portman, who you guys may have heard of because she's won a bunch of Academy Awards. <laughs> I've and heard of her. Yeah, I've heard of her. Yeah. And my joke is when the queen of Star Wars says, hey, do you want to buy a soccer team? You think... I really don't want to let her down, so I might as well explore it. But um, we really got to know each other through our activism and nonprofit work around pay equity, and um, we're both we were both involved with this organization called Times Up. And ultimately, we just started doing things to bring visibility to the players' pay equity um, topics. I thought this was a nonprofit interest of mine, and then after spending a year or so working on these things with her, she said, "Kara, let's go buy a team." And um, I thought, you know what? I'll look into it. And then I had a hundred conversations and 99, 97 people told me I was crazy. Um, and fortunately I found three who thought I wasn't crazy. And one of those three ended up being our initial backers, Serena Williams and Alexis Ohanian, but it kind of all started that way. Um, and then the Chris and Angie part of the story literally started with Chris sending me an email asking me for my annual giving donation. <laughs> so, Kristen's good at that. And, and Chris is particularly good at that. I I know. <laughs> <laughs> so he asked me and I said, oh, Chris, I'm so sorry. I'm delayed in getting back to you. I've been at the World Cup. For, and he's like, I've been at the World Cup. And then we hopped on the phone. And um, it's a really fun story from there. But it was honestly a series of hobbies, passions, and then like bringing the skills in later. But it was a series of butterfly effects that I really feel like led us here. Yeah. And what are, who, who, there's an, a whole bunch of other investors. You know, you sort of have this syndicate, right, of, of investors in the Angel City team. How did that come about? I mean, I've heard Julie Foudy's story. I've heard her speak about this. And maybe talk a little bit about the larger group that you have involved in Angel City. Yeah, we started with a lot of the actresses who were involved in Time's Up because Natalie and I had been so involved in, in, in that. So it did start with that community. And we knew of people who were just interested in with no skin in the game, just essentially bringing like the Spike Lee or Jack Nicholson effect to women's soccer, right? If they showed up at a game, People Magazine would cover it back in the day and more tickets would be bought and people could be paid more money. But so we started with Eva Longoria and America Ferreira and, you know, folks of, you know, Jennifer Garner, folks like that. And then um, candidly, the secret weapon in all of this for, for I think both me and Angie is a woman named Becca Rue, who ran the U.S. Women's National Team Players Association. Um, and she introduced me to Julie Foudy and then Julie, you know, got to know her a little bit. And then we, I met Mia Hamm a different way. And, you know, they're obviously two of the most incredible celebrated female athletes of right. all time. Right. So pretty fun for me to get to hang out with some of my heroes. Um, and they had this idea of let's make this accessible to all the U.S. women national team players who call Southern California home. And all of a sudden we had Abby Wambach and Angela Huckles and it goes from there. And then it's one of those people, like our community is very real. Um, we get on Zooms, you know, once a quarter and we started getting a bunch of inbound interest. And so kept going to Billie Jean King and Lindsey Vaughn and folks like this. And then we just started building it with Real Intent, who really cares about the mission of this being more than just making money or great sport on the field, but all the other things we can do off the field. So I would love, like a lot of it was with high intent of who we wanted around the table and people who really love this in a in a real way. Um, and then a lot of it was just wonderful kind of good things playing on good things. Yeah, that sounds like a Zoom call that might be kind of fun to be on. I'm not sure, but uh, you probably just want to have the Zoom calls just to be on with everyone, right? Forget the whole business part of it just to have some fun, but that sounds incredible. But Angie, talk about your group because I think you've also maybe modeled a bit after what Angel City was doing. I know you guys talked and you have a really interesting ownership group as well. We do. It's it's a much smaller one. Um, so it is. It's myself and Chris, and then our other partner is Brittany Matthews, who um, is Patrick Mahomes' fiance. For anyone that doesn't know, doesn't know Brittany. Brittany's really in her own right a, a successful entrepreneur, and um, I mean she might have more Instagram followers than the entire NWSL, uh, but she is fantastic. She is a former professional soccer player. So she played in Iceland and she's, she and Patrick really are involved in 
at this point now, just about every professional team in Kansas City. And Brittany really wanted to be involved in this. And she is fantastic. She, you know, she's very involved on a, on a daily basis. She has a, a great relationship with the players, you know, as a former player. And, you know, she's really of the same age as, as a lot of our players. And um, it's been fantastic. It's, it is much more, you know, it's, it's Kansas City centric. So, you know, our team is, is not as, as, as big and broad as, um, as Angel City, but it is, uh, you know, very personal and very kind of homegrown. Yeah. Awesome. And um, so, so for both of you, you know, what does it really mean to you to invest in women's sports team and why like right now is this maybe a different opportunity than has existed before? And maybe I'll go stay with you, Angie. Sure. You know, the, the investment level, when you, when you look at it from a pure financial perspective, this is just a business that needed investment. It's not a business that had a problem of, it's not a problem of too much expenses. It's a problem of not enough revenue and people, a lot of, you know, the, the clubs that had started that have kind of been around, um, I think we're really just managing to survive, right. And to be able to kind of each year, just not lose too much money. Um, and I think the, the potential for to, to completely flip it the other way is what we need to be doing, which is to say, what do we need to do to grow it? What do we need to do to grow, you know, revenue, fan base, sponsorships, media? Um, and I think we're, we're pretty lucky too in that um, certainly Kara, but also myself to, to a certain extent got into this with, you know, thinking the investment was a pretty good one without all the tailwinds that we have seen in the last 12 months, I think. Ironically, COVID in and of itself w- was a tailwind, right? It, um, and, it, and it coincided with the first um, CBS deal that the league had. And so when there wasn't a lot of sports on, the NWSL was the first league to do, you know, a football mm-hmm. tournament. And I think that, you know, that brought a lot of fans. And it is, you know, I think still the the biggest challenge that we have is is with broadcast and is with the media and is with if anybody watches, you know, ESPN and Sports Center religiously, there's just not a lot of women's sports on there. And, and I don't know why, because it is, I think, proving time and time again, if you show it, people will watch it. The reason people don't watch it is because it's not shown anywhere. And, you know, the, the ratings for the NWSL championship game last year, higher than the ratings for the MLS championship game. And how much longer has the MLS been around? And you look at the valuations of MLS clubs versus NWSL clubs. And I think it's, it's just fascinating, but um, the ability to to use an investment is, um, I, I think, what makes this decision such an exciting one um, and, and a really fun one because it's not about the level. In, in my mind, it's it's not a problem of, of level of investment; it's return on investment, and the return on investment is incredibly high. You just have not before been the the amount of investment. Yeah, absolutely. Kara, do you want to jump in on that too? Yeah. Um, gosh, this is my favorite topic, but I, 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 I'd slice it up a couple different ways. I'd say, first of all, like when you see something broken and you just can't unsee it, um, I, you know, it's just like, I think, you know, I think when you see something that personally resonates with you, that's as broken as women's sports, um, distribution is, you just like, you, you just, you can't unsee it and you want to go fix it. And so to what Angie said, 4% of sports coverage goes to women's sports. There's a half a a half a trillion dollars, I think, of kind of uh, revenue, ticketing, sponsorships, media, et cetera, that go to sports. And now everyone's very excited because they think the women's side will get up to a billion of that half a trillion. And people are very excited about that. I'm like, hey, hey, folks, like it's going to get up to 250 billion because like slice out what percentage of that is the Olympics and is tennis and the stuff where the women have played a role in driving that overall revenue. And the reality is we just don't even know what this market can look like if you do what I did, which is you go to a game, you get really excited and you are actually able to follow it and watch the content and build an allegiance and build your tribe. Like it's just never been there. So I think the thing that's super exciting about this market is once you actually provide access to even if there's 10 
10 people in a market who want to watch it. If they love it and they're addicted, they're going to bring 10 more. And we've just never been able to do that for women's sports. Um, that's like from the business standpoint, there's some very simple things that were theses when we started that have played out in all the numbers Angie said. I think the second thing is just the power of sports, you know, and this is probably why we're all say, sitting here yeah. um, today is, um, you know, the ability to play sports, build relationships, build community, um, all, all the stuff, right? You know, like the NFL is really important to um, to urban communities to pull people out of poverty. I mean, it, it like I've been told that I've learned that through 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 this and having role models in, in like the dream of if you have a ball and dirt in theory, like it's not that way now because it so heavily comes through club sports and it's still, you know, a sport that requires more money than it should be, but hopefully something that we all begin to fix as we start making money. But it's just, it's the, like, it, it does so much even for my self-esteem as, and I'm sure we'll get to this when Lori comes on, as somebody who walked on to the third boat of a national championship winning team, um, what is it going to do for if you pay that all the way forward on down? Neither Angie nor I got to grow up thinking we could ever be a professional athlete as a, you know, as a, an athlete as a profession. Wasn't even an idea in our head. So um, I think there's just, you know, a lot, a lot from the personal to the business side where what we can, we can show that you can make money for these players um, off of a real and good business that will pay dividends back in, in ways that we can't even comprehend right now. So get, let's get a little granular on that. Like, how do you do it? I mean, so I'm sure you guys are not doing it yourself because you're running really, really successful other businesses and you have people doing the marketing. And But what are some of the sort of guiding principles of how you're going to change this, this dynamic and how, you know, are you going to focus on media rights? Are you going to focus on the social media, the, the commercialization of it? Like, what's the strategy? How, how do we change this sort of dynamic? Maybe, Kara, I'll start with you. Okay. So I think the first thing you do is you find more Angie's, right? So we came into the league as the only, well, sorry, we came into the league and there were other owners that were really helpful in people like Merritt Paulson from, um, from the thorns and, and we'll have a representative of the thorns here later. Um, yeah. But, um, you, you know, you need one owner, one owner can't, you can't bring the mindset of like, you can't have one different mindset or even three different mindsets in a broader league. And so if you bring in more like-minded people and you help, uh, you know, we all help each other um, understand what happens if you um, change the collective bargaining agreement, what happens if you create sponsorship agreements that look like this, that can fund, you know, different camera angles. And so I personally think it starts with, um, with um, multiple, many owners that are well-funded and staffing a strong front office. And now we have many of them, some that were in the league before we got there. But Angie and I both entered the league in the last year. And, um, uh, and you know, many other teams have brought in syndicates like ours since we brought our syndicate in, both famous names and just really smart people that you may never have heard of who um, are willing to put more risk capital up. So I think there, it's the leadership in the league and continuing to invest in um, lead, uh, owners will take risk. I think the second thing is just investing in a smart op a front, op sorry, investing in a strong front office that's willing to make investment that you'll believe will pay dividends two or three years later. And I'll give you, I'll give you one fun, fun anecdote. Um, I'm trying to figure out if I'm trying to figure out if I should say it, but anyway, when I was interviewing players uh, before we got going, let's just say one of the more iconic players who everybody would know. So I'm not going to say her name said to me, um, Kara, I want to make money more than anyone. And if you can figure out a way, give me money in a brown, brown paper bag because I make so much more money off my sponsorships than I do playing for the league. She said, but if I had one wish, it would be to invest, give real, put world-class talent in the front office of every team and then give them capital to build out a marketing effort, a technology effort, a analytically driven scouting effort. She said, I would rather make no money and see that happen and have the players 10 years from now be making what LeBron made than to make a cent more right now, but also figure out how to give me money in a brown yeah. paper. <laughs> yeah, 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 don't forget about that. And you're among friends here. You can say whatever you want. <laughs> um, so, no, so I mean, I agree with, with everything you're saying there, you you have to put the best people in the front office. If you can't run it on a shoestring, this is an investment, and there's so much low hanging fruit. I mean, you to, to start with, what do we have to do to make professional women's sports better? We have to treat it like a professional sport, and not treat it like a women's 
thing, right? Um, it, it's a professional sport like any other professional sport. And I think when you operate under that frame of reference, um, then it's, it's a huge opportunity. Uh, Good. Are there specific ways you guys are doing that, Angie? You know, are there ways that you're, you know, putting in that capital up front, not just in the front office, but maybe what Kara talked about, you know, sort of technology, analytics, marketing. Is that are those your guiding principles? Are those things you're really focused on right now? You know, we we have we bought this team on uh, December. Yeah, sorry, I know you just got started. <laughs> We're on the field, like we're playing games right now. Carrie still got another year, yeah. but um, yes, I mean, we we brought in a COO who um, had been the COO of the WNBA team before. I mean, we are as fast as we possibly can staffing every area, but um, yeah, we're, inv- we're, I mean, we're investing in marketing, we're investing in facilities, we're investing in, um, you know, the, the coaching staff, the equipment, the scouting piece, we're pretty lucky because, you know, our, our head coach has been involved in the sport um, forever, right? And so he has a very good sense. I mean, his, you know, what he was doing before uh, in, included opposition scouting for the women's national team. So he yeah, has a good U.S.-based landscape as well as as, as international one. Um, but, yeah, I, I, you know, in, in every – area we are investing but if you still across the league if you look at the size of staff compared to the size of staff and um other professional leagues we've got a long way to go um, I, by the way can i just jump in just to like praise angie for a second maybe a little bit of chris but i mean angie angie called me on july 21st when we announced our team and said it was a busy day and she said kara i need to figure out how to do this can you help me and i was said yes and so flash forward, we announced our team on July 21st. We're not taking the field until March of 2022. Um, Angie <laughs> got her, like, and we are an expansion team. Angie, Angie bought a team. Angie subsequently bought a team, moved a team, building facilities, found a stadium to play in. So um, it's kind of nuts, Angie, how quickly it went from, I think we should do this to what you've, what you've done and the velocity of that execution. Oh. We, 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 we had a coach, but you know, <laughs> yeah, you had a coach. I mean, right. What, what more do you need? Really good coach. So that was, that was a good start. Yeah. Well, I guess that's actually a really good segue. So you guys are both class of 97. Did, were, did you know each other? Were you, were you oh, yeah. friends back then? Um, and Very talk maybe about the old girls network, right? We have, we have that at Princeton. We talk about it all the time, but talk about the importance of that. And, and I loved how you guys were talking about the rising tide lifts all boats, right? We needed to do it together to get the long-term success that we're all looking for. And it's not a competition. It's like, let's all dive in and throw our assets and our resources towards it and make this happen. But talk about that a little bit. I think it's really interesting how you think about it. Maybe Kara. Uh, Angie, were you in Butler? I'm trying to remember. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, Angie and I were in Wilson and Butler. There was like a bond, you know, for not, not being in the fancy, uh, the fancy parts of the, of the campus. Um, no, but uh, there are many stories Angie and I can tell from college that probably are more appropriate for a smaller group. But um, I would say, I mean, I guess the way I characterize it is I think we're both, we've been, we've stayed in, not weren't in the like, you know, very, very frequent touch. I think we had a lot of, um, we have a lot of connectivity and joy when we come back together at reunions or here or there. Um, I think what was interesting though, is that um, when we found this common connection around soccer and it really was just around, I think in the honesty, it, it happened where Chris and I were emailing and, and then, and then I, and then he said, well, you got to talk to Angie. And I think Angie, when we first got on the phone, I actually think I was still in the mode of pitching you on getting involved with times up. And it was a completely nonprofit oriented pitch. It was just like, I've gotten really into this pay equity stuff, you know, and I would love to have more for-profit thinkers around the table. And can I get you involved? Because I think you just love the community of these women. And it wasn't, it really wasn't like I had an idea in my mind at that point in time that I was going to start a team. And I, I think the thing that's sort of special about where we are um, right now is that you finally have um, sort of this feeling of abundance coming out of all sorts of leaders, but in particular out of 
I think women who, I mean, Angie and I are not young, but we're not old. And we're, you know, we, we, we are still at kind of the primes of our career where we also can take risk. And there's sort of like group economics to taking risks, but we're not afraid to take risks. And so I guess that's the way I would describe it is I got so much energy from realizing you know, after pitching her on a nonprofit <laughs> that um, that she she then called me up when she saw we went for and it was just an idea in my head that we were going to start this this soccer team. Kaylee, we got our funding right before COVID. And I don't know um, if it had I, I don't know if we hadn't gotten that done where we would be. So there's always a little bit of luck in these things. Um, but it is the first I said it is the first time in my life that the old girl, old girls club has ever played out. Um, and I'm seeing this in my professional life as a venture capitalist um, where there's still maybe like 10 or 20 senior women who can kind of really move things behind the scenes. And everyone was competing. And it's only recently moved to collaboration um, where I think there's finally like a generosity and a desire to move things forward as a group. And. Princeton's a very special place. I'll stop, but I'll say there's something just really uniquely special about the communities and the people that come out of Princeton. And having gone to other universities at this point that I'm proud to have gone to, I can say Princeton's just different. And the in the nation service, the not having professional schools, the kinds of relationships you make when moments pop up where you can do this, I think we're better set up to go do this like an all girls club or a co-ed club or whatever club. Um, in a way that I think is very special. Yeah, awesome. And any more thing you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, for me, actually being at She Roars was a huge eye-opening moment for me where I sort of looked around and went, I'm kind of halfway grown up. And maybe now it's time to think, what more can I do other than, you know, I've built a very successful career. Chris and I have built a very successful company in Palmer Square and kind of, now what do I do for the next generation? And it's interesting because it, uh, I, I, the soccer thing kind of fell in my lap, but now I do feel like it is it is a way, you know, Karen, I have the opportunity to be sort of like, we think we talk about our players all the time as being incredible role models in the community. And, um, you know, my, my daughter said, mom, when you, when you were growing up, did you want to be a professional soccer player? I mean, almost as if, did you want to play basketball or soccer? And, and of course, neither one of those were, were an option. And, um, and, and athletics is now an option for a professional sport for, for, for women. But I think, you know, also in business and in everything that we're doing and in taking risk. And that's one thing, Kara, that you've said to me is, you know, I want, like, I, we need to encourage each other to, to take more risk and do more bold things. Was, was there any magic to the team sport concept in this? Or, or And soccer obviously came out of watching the U.S. women's uh, national team play and carry your experience there. But is there any you know magic to the team sport concept? Obviously, we've had professional women's sports in, in golf and tennis for a number of years. We've struggled more to grow the team sports on a professional level. Anything you guys want to address with that? I mean, this is something new, sort of being very successful in an investment from an investment standpoint with team sports. It's been hard to do over the last several years. I mean, Angie, maybe I'll take it first on the personal level, and you can talk more about the business side. But um, I, I, I would say that I, I, I was. I don't think I would have been inspired to do this if I wasn't so actual team, the actual U.S. Women's National Team. Um, so just in terms of like the inspiration to go do it, I actually think I might've had a minor midlife crisis at an early age when I went to the 2015 world cup, because it occurred to me that they were such a team. And I've learned so much about all the things that came out of that world cup, Abby Wambach being on the bench as one of, as one of the greatest players of all time and getting benched in her last world cup and how she handled it. And just like hearing their personal stories of how, you know, this as a sport is what's called a weak link sport. And it's you, which means everyone needs to be a link to make it, <laughs> to make it work, right? One person kind of lets down their guard and it's so low scoring that, that you lose. And, um, and so I was just deeply, deeply inspired by um, knowing all the, getting to know all the personalities, getting to know the troubles they had amongst the personalities and seeing how much they came together and realizing Honestly, in a weird way, what an like what a critically important part of who I am that was for me when I was an athlete, which stopped, you know, and when I was 21 years old. So, 
Um, from a business standpoint, I maybe I'll give it to Andy, Angie to answer, but from like an inspiration standpoint, and now we see it in our community and we see it in our teams and like paying these people, figuring out how to make enough money to pay these people. I found it this incredibly powerful driver to want to figure it out. Awesome. And anything? I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, I hadn't thought about the fact that a team sport was different. Now that you say it, it's so blatantly obvious. And you look at, you know, the kind of famous women athletes that, that have existed in the last decades, right? Um, and and there hasn't been such a delineation. I mean, tennis is a great example. Uh, but with, with soccer, to me, the, the obvious point was, well, everyone loves the women's national team. Like that, those are some of our most famous athletes in this country. And what, why do we not have, you know, because I, I think most of us on this call could name a lot of the women's national team. And maybe we could name a handful of men's national team players, right? So why is there not professional women's soccer that is that is as you know popular as professional men's soccer. It doesn't make any sense in this country, which is so, you know, in the sport of soccer is, is really dominated by women. Um, that was more my line of thinking than, but I obviously love team sports. You know, a rugby is, is an example of a, of a sport that's, I think, the ultimate team sport. And I think rugby people and soccer people could argue over which one is more important to play as a team. But um, I could see both sides of it now as a soccer owner, but as a rugby player, you know, women's team sports are amazing. You're, you, the camaraderie that you have together, the, the joy of watching female athletes celebrate together in an accomplishment, I think is unparalleled. Yeah, no, I mean, I know they're gonna tell me that I have to stop asking questions, but I have about a hundred more. So <laughs> staying on that subject of what sports did for both of you. I mean, again, achieve, serve, lead. You guys check all the boxes. It's amazing what you're doing. You're changing the world. You're changing the, the, the world for young girls. You're changing the world for the women who are playing right now. But you know, what did did sports play a role in getting you to where you are in your careers? Kara, I'll go to you. I mean, yes, 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 and yes. <laughs> um, people always ask me if I played soccer, and I say no. Um, but um, yeah, you know, I played only team sports and um, uh, you know, basketball in high school, and then crew in college, and. Um, I don't think, you know, you live one life and you live the life looking through your own eyes. And so you don't know what's, you know, so I don't know a world in which I wasn't always playing team sports, but I think, um, all the thing, you know, I mean, I, I, Angie and I are, you know, two women who came up in finance still when that was unusual. And there's a lot of reasons why, um, where we had some advantages like going to Princeton and, but one of them was, was, was playing sports. I think, you know, it just kind of teaches you the kinds of teams you, you see win and you see lose and what you want to be a part of and teaches you that you, you know, at least me, it taught me, you know, you want to be able to celebrate your victories with others and console each other when it's not working. And then, I mean, very specifically, Lord <laughs> Lori, I would say one thing I took away from doing Princeton crew was literally nothing would be more painful <laughs> than a 2000 meter erg test, like literally nothing. And so as long as I could breathe and I wasn't going to throw up, I kind of knew I could just sit and push through really crappy stuff that happened in business. And, um, it made me very confident. I would say it just made me very confident. And in some ways, I think actually being on such an exceptional team, the team I was on, but as one of the people who had to fight to stay on that team, um, I'm, I'm grateful. It's probably the greatest sort of like early, didn't succeed quite at the levels I wanted to, even in a, the context of like a very, very successful team that gave me, a, I think, a lot of the resilience that pushed through. But I think it just taught me I like to win with others and I like to lose with others. And sports gives you that in a really meaningful way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that confidence um, conversation is a really interesting one. I We had Chris Everett Ever on a, um, a call with our staff and with our with some of our student athletes last week or two weeks ago, Coach Henderson, Mitch Henderson, um, had her on for 30 minutes. And for me, I got to be on camera with Chris Everett, you know, an a, a idol and someone that I looked up to my whole life. And I really wanted to ask her, we did, ran out of time, but, you know, did your confidence develop because you were great at athletics or were you great at athletics because you were confident? You know, and I, I think about that in my own life, you know, just be having the ball at your feet at the penalty, you know, for the 
penalty kick and having to perform in that moment, does that help you have to perform in the boardroom or is it something you're born with? But it's something I think about all the time, but I think confidence is something that's huge for women. And we need to be able to enter into those conversations and negotiations with a great deal of confidence and wanting the puck or the ball or whatever it is at your feet and to be able to take that shot. So um, yeah, Anne's jump in. Well, the other thing that I would say is that, um, it, it teaches you to fail and be okay with it and get back up and go try again. And I think um, it, you know, I, I, they, it can't say enough about how important that is. And, and I feel like m maybe as women, we don't do that enough. Like when we talk about taking risks, we don't take risks because we don't want to fail. And when you play sports, you get to practice all the time at failing um, and then, and then it, it, it's succeeding. And I think it also teaches you that anything is possible. Um, uh, you know, we, we won a national championship without a coach, right? A anything is possible because we all <laughs> came together and worked as hard as we possibly could and we did it. Awesome. Amazing. Awesome. Well, one, I think we're going to bring in some guests here in, in one minute, but just one last question. I mean, again, I had a lot more and I really didn't get into sort of this idea of giving back to the community with your program. So maybe you weave that into the conversation with some of the, the guests that we're having uh, jump onto the screen to ask some questions, because I think people are really interested in how you guys have rethought professional sports and sort of the way you're reinvesting in the communities as well. But I think this is a really important one for all the undergraduates that are listening, you know, what advice can you give to either our, our undergraduates or to some of the young alums who are really just getting started with their careers, you know, and, and how they can continue to support um, their own career growth, but also continue to support the growth of women's athletics? So maybe, Kara, I'll go to you. Yeah, I'll, I'll, the quick one I'd say is um, everyone who's watching as an undergrad is probably a massive achiever. And you're probably thinking about your life and your career in as, as like, one major thing. And I would just encourage you at the times in your life when you're of energy to have major, have a major, but also have minors and don't need the minors to be um, a thing that works. I think that's your career, like leave room for just pure passion and friendships and set up your life so that serendipity can play a role in doing something extraordinary at the times you least expected. And it may happen in your twenties, your thirties, your forties, it may happen in your eighties, but um, don't just be one thing, leave room for hobbies and leave room for minors. Awesome. Love it. Angie, how about you? Trust your gut, follow your gut. If, um, if some, you know, you're thinking about a career choice or, or what you want to do, um, investigate it, do your homework, but then don't be afraid to do the thing that, that you really think is right. I love it. Okay, so um, let's jump in. I think this is a special, particularly special guest for you here, Kara. Um, <laughs> we're gonna bring in our women's open rowing coach, uh, the great, the wonderful, the esteemed Lori Daphne. Hello, it's so hi. nice to see you all. And, I love uh, Hi, I'm totally inspired by you both. So thank you for, for coming on today and, um, and sharing your wisdom with us. Um, Kara, obviously I have to ask you uh, a question uh, because I know you've asked, um, I can't tell you how proud we are in this program uh, to have you as a teammate. And um, I think you tend to underestimate your impact in the program. Um, it's funny when I look back at you and your undergrad career, I think about, um, I think a little bit about your rowing, but I think about how much you made us laugh and how you made the team smile and how you really brought people together. And it's so interesting now to hear you talk because that's exactly what you do in your profession. And I could see it in you when you were, you know, just a youngster. So uh, keep up the good work. My question has to do with, um, do you tell any rowing stories in, uh, in your work? Yes. First of all, Lori, thank you. Uh, we, Lori, Lori and I need to have a whole separate Zoom that we record. Um, but a uh, pivotal part of my, my journey and probably one of my favorite memories of the last 10 years is when I showed up at the tanks and Lori was there and she gave my now 10-year-old daughter a, a lesson in the tanks. And it just was one of the most special moments I've had since graduating. Um, but to answer your question, of course, I talk about crew all the time. I like share callous stories and I talk about, like, like I always say when you've rode crew, if you meet another person who's rode crew, you can literally go in the corner and talk about bucket rigs for two hours and 
find it really fascinating. But um, yeah, I talk about it all the time because I always think about crew as the ultimate team sport. Um, if you're, if you're, um, hands are a little too high or too, a little too low. If your catch is a little too slow, which of course mine never was, right, Lori? Yeah, uh, <laughs> you throw off the boat and then you lose. And so you have to be in unison. And yet it is the hardest sport to maintain the team dynamic because you're always competing against your best friends for that last seat in the best boat. And so I think psychologically, it's a really interesting one to unpack. And I talk about it a lot, but I think there are just tremendous lessons around um, you know, how you can be competitive with yourself and then how you kind of create the right dynamic to create a real team um, experience. Um, and I, I have told every national team player many crew stories. I'm not sure if they like them or not, but I like them a lot. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. That's great. And I can't wait for your kids to row. Yeah, and Kara, you <laughs> tell your story a little bit about how you found Lori and the, the open rowing team. I mean, I love that story. And you were sort of just trying to do everything at Princeton, which is kind of the advice that you gave to the undergrads, you know, sort of get involved, be a joiner, participate in things that you might not ever have had the chance to do. But just briefly, kind of how you found the boathouse. Yeah, well, so I did, I just, when I got to Princeton, I signed up for like every activity, a lot of them non-sports wise, but, um, you know, the conservative debate society and the liberal debate society, I didn't even know what I was, but I, um, I, I wanted to play sports. I wasn't good enough, I think, to play any of the sports I played in high school at Princeton. I tried to actually walk onto the basketball team that didn't, didn't work. Um, and then I literally signed up for the rugby team and the ski team. And then Lori, I think it was, I don't know if you probably don't do this anymore because it's all online, but Lori basically was stopping every person over five, eight who walked through Dylan gym and saying, do you want to try to row crew? And I think I was like just on the cusp. So I saw her stopping all these people and I kind of lingered a little bit. <laughs> um, and then she did. And I would just remember going down to the boathouse and I was one of like 90 freshman women and somebody handed me a hot dog and said, come try it. And that's how it all began. Yeah. And Lori does still do that, by the way. I know, I do. Not in COVID time, but otherwise mm -hmm. she's trolling the uh, Dylan Jim activity fair, finding the tallest, most, most athletic women on campus. So that's why she's amazing. Mm -hmm. She's leading that's how really I found so <laughs> unturned. Uh, Lori's doing it. So amazing. Thank you. Thank you, coach. And, and uh, yeah, thank you very much. Next, we're going to bring out Bryant Blunt, who is what we call a super fellow. He is a class of 08, but he's also, he works in the uh, Dean of Students office, supporting students in many, many different ways at the university, track and field alum, fellow to many of our varsity teams, and just a super, we have this, what we call the team around the team. Bryant sort of epitomizes and, and symbolizes everything that's great about our team around the team. So Brian, I'll turn it to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you both for joining. I'm actually really excited to ask a question after hearing this conversation. And you, know, you talked a lot specifically about, I think, the, the, the world you've decided to dive into here. But um, I'm thinking of it in the Princeton context. As um, Molly said, I work closely with undergraduates. Princeton changed my life in all kinds of ways. I'm sure it changed yours. And, and I think that you know, for the students here now who are going to hopefully one day be changed and lead, um, you know, I really hope they can hear your lessons or others can hear your lessons. And one of the things that I'm reflecting on is um, Shirley Tillman, the first woman president of Princeton in 2011, commissioned a, uh, a task force that's really looking at women's leadership. And one of the key takeaways from that is that women, more than men, tend to hold behind the scenes positions or seek to make a difference outside of, at least on our campus, elected office or sort of officially anointed leadership. Um, but you know, in those last 10 years, we've seen, I think, dramatic shifts in roles traditionally held by men on our campus. The USG president, um, you know, class governments that really sort of bring everyone together, um, presence of eating clubs even. You know, we've had several years now where that balance looks more like what our student body looks like. Um, and hearing from you and seeing you both as role models both in your professional careers and now with this link of team ownership, I would love to hear you talk about the impact of having women lead organizations that have traditionally been led by men. Yeah, Angie, let's go to Angie on that one. I think we still have more progress to be made, um, both in finance and sports, then it seems like Princeton has made a lot of progress uh, in, in the last two years, but I do think, um, you know, I feel like I'm part of helping make that change possible. 
uh, you know, starts with Kara and then comes me and uh, let's bring another. Awesome. Kara, anything you want to jump in on? Yeah, I mean, I think we probably have to say like Angie and I are Princeton educated white women, right? So I don't want to take away from anything we've done because um, it's been hard, but we have so, so, so much further to go. And one of the things I've learned as a woman um, in industries that used to like make a thing of her celebrating being the only woman and tried to make women feel good about that, that is you're just not really making any progress until, well, you're not, I shouldn't say you're not making any progress. You're not making progress until you're bringing forward and, you know, kind of people who aren't like you and you don't look like you don't come from the same background as you. And um, I just think we have to acknowledge um, how much further we have to go on all of those fronts. And I, I think probably, you know, it's, there's a lot of joy around what we're doing, um, but we also need to set expectations in a way where we know there will be mistakes made and there are things that aren't going to go as well at certain times. But if you look at the composition of our organizations five years from now, hopefully they'll look very different than the composition of organizations today in sports. In the money that's come in, in the people that we hire, in, you know, and there's some creative things that I think we're both doing around sponsorship dollars and, you know, taking 10% of those dollars and putting them into community initiatives around everything from, you know, sports bras to girls who don't have it. Like there are girls who just can't play sports because they do not have a sports bra. They cannot afford to have one sports bra. Right. And, um, and anyway, so I think, um, I think it is just the beginning and um, I hope more people will get involved with this, but I think we also have to acknowledge that it's going to be like, a hundred years of fighting to continue to make progress. Maybe just expand on that because that was sort of how I led into the first question from, from Lori, you know, the sort of giving back and, and how is that across the entire um, NWSL? Is that specific to your teams? Is that again, one of those guiding principles that is going to make a difference with this league? Angie, do you want to take that first? I feel like I'm talking too much. <laughs> you always talk. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> This one you should take first because this one we 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 flat this is no it's not across the league we flat out copied it from LA because we thought it was such a great idea and um, I mean I do I think initially you know we brought this team to Kansas City and and at first all my thoughts were around these are great role models for girls to look up to right and then I started you know learning and thinking and realizing that. Um, not, not only do are we making an impact in terms of you know role models of potential path forward for professional female athletes, but also we have a real opportunity to impact our communities, right? And and beyond that, we we have an obligation to impact our communities because we have assets that other people don't, right? So we're getting assets in terms of money, in terms of sponsorship, but also in terms of like the the power of the you know the arms that keep spreading out and every you know if, if we touch one person who touches another ten and each of them touch another ten I mean those tentacles I think are are, are really powerful and it you know I mean I, I've never had a job that my kids thought was cool before right but they think <laughs> it's really cool and I think that within the community it's it's the same thing I think through the power of something that is so exciting as professional sports to be able to um, give back to the community. So we are giving 10% of all of our sponsorship dollars um, directly back into uh, nonprofit organizations. Yeah, yeah and I, I think this is something that we all obviously care deeply about. I think, Kara, you touched on it. I mean, being able to be a great athlete is a privilege and it doesn't, it's not a privilege that is afforded to everyone. I mean, I think there are real inequities in sport, um, in youth sport. And so what you guys are doing is so important. We need to build that pipeline and give, just like we need to give educational opportunities to kids from under-resourced background, we need to give sport because we all know how it's changed our lives. So I, I am extremely committed to that notion. And I know you guys are too. And Molly, I'll just say one quick thing. I mean, so I mean, I really think Angie and I need to kind of live by where we use carrots, where we use sticks, where we have a lot of comfort and confidence around the things we're doing first and where we have a lot of humility around the things we've never done before. Um, we are two of 11 owners and there are a lot of people who've been doing this for a long time where we're just coming in as the new kid on the block. And so I, I do think our goal when we started was to, to, to start a fire that was then picked up and started elsewhere. And so Angie coming in, honestly, in a lot of ways, I think I felt more pride the day that I knew Angie was going to get the team than the day we announced because 
like if you just do it once, it just doesn't, you know, it matters, but it is doing it twice and three times and four times. And then, and so it is a give and a take where we have to, you know, be careful um, and co conscientious that, you know, of how we go about doing this. But I would say the sponsorship bit was actually launched by my co-founder, Julia Ehrman, who is the CEO of our, who runs it day to day and allows me to do my day job and, and to sit in all the glory and these sorts of things. But um, we don't, you know, we, we've donated one out of every $10 to a local cause. And uh, I think we have now the highest um, sponsorship kind of the highest sponsorship dollars for a Jersey sponsor in our Jersey sponsorship, for example, with DoorDash, where I can't disclose the total amount, but it's in the league of, it's in the level of men's leagues. And I think Angie and other teams are now they're also doing that, but you know, we have a eight figure deal where 10% of that eight field figure deal is going to food insecurity in Los Angeles, um, which is a really huge, pro no one's ever done that before in sponsorships. And Angie did, did it immediately, Angie and Chris. And so, um, I think things like that, hopefully you'll see more of when you have more diverse leadership in things people care about that are culturally relevant. Yeah. And I think people care about causes in a very passionate way. And so it's brilliant. And just want to thank you guys for that and congratulate you on it. So Brian, thank you very much. I think we're now going to bring on um, one of our student athletes who is in her own way leading um, remarkably on campus is Serena Starks, who's helped uh, recently found Asian students at Princeton. And we've been working really collaboratively with her through our Tigers Together initiative, providing the most diverse and inclusive environment within Princeton athletics. And Serena has been an unbelievable partner. We're super proud of her. She's a sophomore on the women's softball team, as I, as I said. So I'm going to turn to you, Serena. Thanks, Molly. Hi, guys. It's really nice to, to see you on Zoom. And um, I'm also from Southern California, and I used to play soccer. So it's really great to hear that women's soccer is, you know, moving forward. Um, but I know, Carrie, you were talking about how it was hard to convince people to invest. And so my question is, um, what are some ways that you've had to prove to people who don't really believe that women's sports can take off or be worth the investment? Because it seems like we are making a lot of po positive progress. Um, but then uh, a couple months ago, seeing the women's basketball team tournament versus the men's, um, there's still a huge disparity between the two. Um, so is there any specific instances when individuals have doubted you or um, tried to slow down the movement? And how have you shown adversity during those times? Yeah. Um, so um, some of the people who are investors and sit around the table and are the most helpful now are at Angel City are some of the people who told me this was impossible. So first of all, just let be kind to people if they think you're crazy, because <laughs> they can be very helpful later on. Um, I think in a lot of ways, you have to find people who have sort of a, who, have, who have a venture capital mindset. And that doesn't mean they're in venture capital. And Jean and Chris have a venture capital mindset. A lot of the people who were interested in Angel City before it was a thing, um, came out of private equity. Um, but but it, it was still a needle in a haystack to find these people. Um, I think you look at frameworks or statistics that help, like, I think sometimes when people think they know something to be true, and then you give them an empirical example of something in the world that may prove them wrong, um, they pay attention. And I'm trying to think of the best example to give you quickly. But, um, you know, you could just talk about like, the the, um, you know, the statistics, like there's statistics now around how many people watch the NWSL Challenge Cups. And that's on right now. Angie, what, you'll have to tell everybody where to watch it. But if, if you, if you can show that. The Plus. Every where? Paramount Plus, which is CBS All Access. So it's either on CBS, CBS Sports Network or Paramount. If you watch the Super Bowl, you know what Paramount Plus is. They advertised. Yeah. There's stats now where you can say it's every single game is more people are watching than X. And I'm going to get X wrong here, but certainly more than Major League Baseball games, often more than hockey games and basketball games. Um, at the time, it was like, hey, when you get one NWSL game on, more people watch that than Premier League or a regular season NBA game at the time. And you're just like, really? Is that happening? And yes, it's happening. And so you just have to find that like those stats. And then there's some other interesting things that really resonated with people that we don't have enough time for. But I I'm very happy to tell you offline when we do. Awesome. Angie, how about you? Our, our biggest issue has actually been the team that was in Kansas City before, while it had amazing performance on the field, won two championships, it had, it it failed, it, right? It got to kicked out of Kansas City. It had to leave. And so to convince people that had already kind of, you know, lost a team from here um, 
the media, you know, you, you already had one failed women's soccer team, right? And, um, but they've been, I completely won over. Um, and it just, you know, you have, we have to build the foundation of trust again. We have to treat it like you treat any other professional sport. And then people start to treat it like they treat any other professional sport. Um, Women's sports does not have to be the other, right? Women's sports is what it is because what it is. So I love that and, and treat it like a professional sport and like an investment. And that's what I love that you guys are doing is you want a return on your investment and you're going to invest in it to make sure that that return um, comes and, to and I, keep, I keep saying that you have to think of like, you think I'm liking this because there's some secret part of me that's actually venture capital, which there is. <laughs> I'm a credit investor. Like we, I, I lend money to places where I know I'm going to get a good return back. That, that that's more our, our business at Palmer Square. But um, <laughs> I think it's a, a very interesting place where it's a good safe credit investment and a good venture. I mean, it's it's like a convertible bond or something with warrants. Like you get like the safe return plus the upside. So I agree with that. And I just say, here's where the venture capital comes in. I think these teams have the potential to be worth as much as Manchester United or the Dallas Cowboys. So it is the best investment out there. Angie and I will lay out all the risks for you, but you're not going to lose your money and your upside is tremendous. And so, you know, that, that's, that's double, triple, quadruple, probably 10 X. I don't think you have to get to a thousand X for it to be a good deal. It, it, I, I think you, Right. <laughs> I, I think you guys just answered Serena's question. Like no matter who's doubting you, you're going to prove, prove them wrong. You're going to tell them why to do this. You guys are tremendous salespeople. So Serena, thank you very much. And thanks for your leadership. So Angie, I'm going to tee up a video. You're not going to love this video very much, but it'll make a little bit of sense when we bring our next guest on. So Cody, let's roll the, the quick little video. Play this down the right touchline header is in Lucy. Tyler Lucy doubles the Portland lead. Okay, okay, so that was Tyler scoring on Kansas City. Angie, you're smiling at least, but um, oh, Tyler, it's a beautiful goal. It's hard to not smile. Um, yes, our all time leading scorer, class of 17, right, Tyler? Yes. Um, and uh, she's here to ask you guys our last final question. I said, as I said, I think we could go on all night asking you guys questions and engaging with you, but Tyler's going to close us out here. Well, as, uh, as much as that hit I took after the goal, it, it's uh, great when the ball hits the back of the net. Um, but hearing both of you uh, is really incredible. And I just first off have to say, Karen, Angie, thank you from all the women's players for being incredible role models through your actions and investment. Uh, it is most appreciated. And to see powerful, strong women supporting each other uh, is just it's, it's great to see that as an example. Um, and I look up to both of you and Molly as well as our AD. Love to see that as a woman. Uh, so my question is about different investment models for professional leagues uh, and specifically the possibility of taking the NWSL public uh, and providing opportunities for the fans to come into the owner box. Uh, I'd love, love to hear your uh, unique perspectives. Uh, what you think of the, the potential success or sustainability of that model, because it's something that I, I'm very passionate. Kara, okay. I'll go to you. <laughs> I mean, come on, Angie's harassing me here. Um, Angie, would you like me to take it or would oh, you no. like me? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's a really interesting time because you're also democratizing access and institution like inst you're both like, uh, so to answer your question, I think there's a couple things that could uh, be interesting for professional sports in general and then women's sports as well. One is just, um, it's an asset class that hasn't historically had what we call institutional capital, right? It's been primarily wealthy families. Um, and, um, and that's sort of, you know, changed with Angel City very specifically, like we built it in a different way. But in general, I think that's changing and you're seeing more institutional capital come into these leagues. And the more we can create room for many people to participate, even at small le levels and buying into teams, um, I think we see the power of Robin Hood and a bunch of other things around retail investors, not always good, but 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 important. And, and there's a lot of good, a lot of good that comes. Um, it's also just, you know, a moment in time where there's a lot of innovation more broadly in the capital markets, everything from, 
you know, SPACs and, and, and different ways to take companies public all the way to something that's going to sound wacky, but I'm totally happy to talk to anyone smart at Princeton listening in the undergrad community, but things like DAOs and NFTs, um, which are, you know, kind of new social tokens and, and new kind of forms of ways to sell off forms of IP without actually selling off parts of the company. And these things are not going to change the way we form companies and raise capital overnight. But I truly think these things can impact sports sooner than almost anything else. And I send emails, not all the time, but on occasion to the people involved with Angel City around how we should be experimenting for sure with NFTs and more recently with DAOs, um, which we could do a separate session on um, because there are ways to create democratized access right now just to things like who picks the beer in the supporter section, like things where you can just test out different forms of governance. So it's a really fun time to be an investor that doesn't need to take credit levels of risk <laughs> because I can, I can play around with these things in other places. And maybe at some point in time, I figure out how to bring them in. But right now I'd say I'm most interested in just creating uh, bring, bring a path to bring more types of investors into teams like Angel City and Kansas City. And I think we're already starting to do that with the way we're building our syndicate. Awesome. Angie, anything to add to that? I really don't have much to add. Kara's thought about this, I think, a little bit. She didn't have that queued up and it, it didn't know that question was coming either, but clearly has thought about it. But um, Amazing question, Tyler. Um, amazing success you've had. You continue to make us really proud. And, um, and she tried just not to score on these guys anymore. That's the only thing that I think they may ask out of this. You just is, need to defend better. I, you know. <laughs> Tyler, until I have a team, my heart is with Angie. But the first game I ever went to was a Thorns game. And I do secretly wear my Thorns sweatshirt to sleep. Just, just letting you know. <laughs> love it. Love it. <laughs> Uh, no. Lucy on the back? Are you putting Lucy on the back? I need it. I need it. Say hi to Kling for me, though. She'll tell you all about it. I will. I'll send you a jersey. I'll send you both. Yeah. <laughs> send me a picture with Kling. And uh, yeah, I'd love, I'd love a Lucy jersey. Uh, yeah. I'm happy to pay for it. <laughs> well, thank you both so much. Um, just, just to see this and hear you both. Um, it's really to see the growth of women's soccer and to continue with women, supporting women. Uh, is just incredible and it's it's powerful. So thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, Tyler. Well, I think, you know, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. This has been incredibly fun. Apparently I'm eight minutes over time. That's not a surprise to many people who know me, but I guess we, we had a, a, just a really engaging conversation. We're so grateful to you, Angie and Kara, for joining us tonight, for making us so proud as, um, you know, amazing Princeton alumni. And um, just want to uh, thank everyone else. A reminder for tomorrow night, we have another great evening of programming. Um, we're featuring a, a panel of four additional uh, remarkable Princetonians. So if you want to log on, visit Princeton, uh, GoPrincetonTigers.com for more information. And thank you all, and go Tigers. Go Tigers. Thank you. See you guys. Thanks a lot. This is awesome. <laughs>